What up, what up, what up, what up? It's me, L Teddy 27. Good night, right about the hood. Oh, dear God. I'm already eating the drink. Look at damn mess. It's just a damn mess. Please no, and yes, please no. What up, what up, what up, what up, what up, what's good, people? What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? It's me, L Teddy 27, and I am back for yet another review. This is going to be my review for Real Life and Philanthropy. This is season one. It is episode nine. It is the season finale. It is entitled More Donations, More Problems. Now, y'all already know what it gives real life and philanthropy. Y'all know when I see the Blunder twins, y'all know who the Blunder twins are. We got to mask it up because them whores, I swear they are agent zero and one for COVID or some other nefarious disease. I'm telling y'all, we've been masking it up for these whores damn near the whole season. Because they scared me. Ger that Gerald and Jerome, the Blunder twins, they are carriers of something. If, even if it's just fuck shit and fuckery. Anyway, we start off. Y'all, I'm so surprised. I made it all the way through this whole season. Shouts out to MVN, my subscriber MVN. She got me this mask as well. Shouts out to her. Anyway, um, I'm surprised I made it all the way through the season. Like, y'all know we were struggling, struggling to make it at points. But we made it, girl. We made it. Dragging them whores by their skull and all. But, you know, we made it. We're at the end, honey. All we got left is the reunion. So let's get this over with and out of the way, honey. Shouts out also to um, Jamie. We interviewed Jamie on, um, what is today? Two days ago, maybe? Something like that. Two days ago, we interviewed Jamie. Um, Wednesday night? No, Tuesday night. Tuesday night, I think it was. It One of the nights this week, I don't know, child. But we did, and that went well. Um, check that out on my channel. You can go look at that interview. We have a lot of fun. Hopefully, we'll be interviewing more of the cast. Um, so let's get it over with Malik and Gerald. Um, not Gerald. Malik and Jerome. They go out and they talk, you know, they try and talk it out after the New Orleans trip. And they try to, um, you know, see if they can have a meeting of the minds or whatever. Jerome claims that Malik is ganging up on Gerald. How? Because last time I checked, Jerome, you and Gerald are the one that's always ganging up on people. Like, y'all always do y'all blunder twin powers. Activate. Form of fuck shit. Shape of a piece of shit. How? Malik by himself is ganging up on people. Yet, you and your fellow blunder twin always ganging up on everybody. Y'all always tag teaming on everybody. But he's the one that's ganging up on Gerald. Now, make this shit make sense. The other thing that Jerome gives me, this bitch, I can't even call him delusional. I, I'm not going to call him delusional. I would say, yeah, I can't even say he's delusional because I think he's very cognizant of what he's doing and how he's behaving. And, you know, what he does is this. I think that he believes that people are ill-informed and unintelligent enough to go along with the notion that because he comes off as being articulate and because he may come off as being mild mannered or he may not be as loud and may not have, uh, dim display as much bravado as the other person, then automatically he's right or his um, his side is the you know right side. No, bitch. No means no. And yes means no. Like, we're not stupid. We're seeing this, Jerome. The problem is you and Gerald, not everybody else. Because he was talking about some um that um he got upset with Malik because he said that Malik was saying stuff about um Gerald behind his back. And Malik was like, no, you stupid dick fuck. I told him that to his face. And you got yourself all in a hissy fit mad talking about something. I'm talking about Malik uh, Gerald behind his back. And I told Gerald that shit to his face when he came at me. Why is any of that your business? The other thing is, he called you out and called you straight to the carpet. Well, I had only told uh, Gerald such and such. And I, he was like, uh, uh obviously you told somebody else because I didn't even get that information from Gerald. Somebody else told me that. You can't lie yourself through this, Jerome. We're not stupid. We're not idiots. I don't know who, what type of people you hang around. I don't know 
what caliber of individuals you usually try to get over on over here. We're not that caliber of people. Let's be clear. Now, if you see, you can try this with other members of the cast, but this one right here, you're not on my level, boo. See, I, I, listen, I can weed through all of your bullshit from afar off. I clocked you a long ways off, Jerome. I knew you was about fuck shit and fuckery a long ways off. See, my discernment, my discernment here is impeccable, okay? And I can see the, mm -mm. you might get over on the other people, you ain't never gonna get over on me. Because you ain't about shit. And we see it on display over and over and over. A damn mess is what you are. A damn mess. As bad as Gerald is, I keep telling y'all, Jerome is the worst person on this cast. He is horrible. He is the least of us. God help us. Anyway, eventually, Malik um, got so frustrated. He was like, fuck this shit, I'm gone. So he gets up and leaves. Then Jerome in the confessional goes off on this tirade talking about, oh, Malik is weak. Malik is weak. He can't do this. He can't do that. And then, <laughs> shots out to production because production is so shady. Production. Y'all knew exactly what y'all was doing. So, <laughs> Jerome went on this whole tirade talking about how weak Malik is and Malik is so weak, this, that, the third. Then, production follows that up by showing this, um, uh, Video of Jerome still at the place after Malik had left. Calling Malik on the phone. I don't know if he was talking to Malik's voicemail or talking to Malik and Malik just wasn't talking on the phone. But now you got Jerome backpedaling and pussy popping and doing everything in his power to try to apologize to Malik. Talking about, oh, I just didn't see it that way. And I just think that um, I didn't know that made you that upset. Yes, you did. Fucking liar. The only reason that you... You know, try to come off so contrite and try to come off as if you were trying to find a resolution is because Malik was not there. You, my friend of the weak one, you couldn't express all of that. You didn't have the testicular fortitude and intestinal fortitude and wherewithal enough to do that when Malik was face to face with you. No, because you were on the fuck shit and fuckery like always. So what did you do? You waited till he got up and left. And now that you're not face to face with it, now that you're not confronted face to face with the problem, now your weak ass, your punk ass want to sit back and now you want to call and act like, oh, I'm going to be the bigger person and apologize. You ain't the bigger shit. That's all you are. Excuse me. Is the bigger pile of shit. You ain't shit, Jerome. I, but you want to call Malik the weak one. But when he was there, you ain't have none of this. Girl, see the big person, the stronger person, the person with that, you know, that's not weak is the one that confronts the problem right there and say, you know what? I got that wrong. I was wrong. Let me apologize to you face to face. Let me be a man. Shake your hand or whatever. Do whatever I got to do and say, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. I can say that to you in your face because that's what grown ass men do. Grown ass men don't leave messages in my voicemail and shit like that when I was just face to face with you. I can't. Y'all know how I've been about Jerome all season. I just can't. I, he makes my nuts itch. I keep talking. Oh, dear God. He's one of the main reasons I got to have on masks when I do my goddamn interviews. Then we got Jamie and Gerald. Um, they went out to, it was like, at first, I, they went out to this, the non-for-profit, but then they were in like this room where the rest of the cast eventually got there and they were all, you know, eating and drinking and stuff like that. And I guess they were supposed to be given donations that were going to be donated to this place and it was supposed to be this big thing and it ended up just being them sitting around talking and shit and i didn't really understand the point of this scene nothing came out of it um kwanzaa displayed her you know ignorance dear god oh and high god oh jesus kwanzaa you give me like i always say one of the kids in the back of the class still asking somebody to tell them how to get how to get to sesame street can you tell her how to get, how to get to Sesame Street? I don't, bless her heart. That's one of the bless her heart kids. I, listen. Y'all want to know what happens to those slow kids in class? The kids that's just dumb as a box of rock. The kids that every time they raise their hand, the entire class, including the teacher, simultaneously begins to cringe just trying to imagine what's going to fall out of their mouths 
like Kwanzaa in school and now you see what happens to them when they get grown. They get on these shows and they make statements like, why is it called Lost and Found? I don't understand. I wouldn't donate to something called Lost and Found because of the name of it. First of all, the name is more than appropriate. Actually, it's quite ingenious, the name itself. First of all. Second of all, if you are a fellow member of the um, Rainbow Coalition, the LGBTQIA plus community, and you say to um, an organization, I'm not going to give to you just because I don't like your name. The problem is you, unless, I mean, unless you told me that their name had like an F-bomb in it or some, um, you know, hom um, homophobic epithet attached to it, then I might go with you. But you saying that you have a problem with it being called Lost and Found Youth, an organization designed to help homeless youths have a place to stay. You don't get the connection and don't see how the name is appropriate. But like I said, the girl is sitting in the back of class looking for somebody to tell her how to get, how to get to Sesame Street, how to get to Sesame Street. Anyway, and then what would an episode be like if the Blunder Twin Twins did not activate their powers? Blunder Twin Powers activate form of a pile of shit, shape of a piece of shit. These whores then decided that um they were going to tag team on Roshane. Mind you, remember, it was Jerome earlier who was talking about Malik was ganging up on Gerald. So Gerald apparently had some shit to say about Roshane and Carrie in, um, on social media in the comment section. And basically was saying, when I see you whores on December 5th, it's going to be go time. We are here for all the smoke. December 5th came and Ger Gerald was not here for none of the smoke. None of it. So Roshane was like, girl, where's this energy? What had happened? What had happened? What was said? Gerald then tried to do the passive aggressive thing and act like he ain't want none of the smoke. Girl, I keep telling you, Gerald, real girls do real things. And girl, if you got all that smoke for people in the um, comment section, baby, you better be ready to have that smoke in real life. I'm just saying. Anyway, a mess, a damn mess. I mean, you went as far as to say, when I see you on X and X date, Girl, that, that's the rats. That's basically, you, you said, girl, I'm ready. It's on site on that day. And when he came and said, girl, what's up? Girl, you ain't have nothing to say. And then you tried to get your little blunder twin to help you and shit. This shit was weak. This shit was weak. Why is my phone going off? Who's calling me? Whatever, I'll call him back. Um, yeah, it, this shit was weak. I mean, because Jerome tried to jump into it. This shit didn't go nowhere. I ain't understand that. That scene, I ain't understand that whole scene right there. But even Zay was there. But whatever. Um, We did see Kwanzaa was invited over Roshane's house by Roshane. So Carrie is there because I think Roshane and Carrie are roommates. And there was another trans woman there named Juicy and another one of their um, Roshane's friends in there. And it was a good conversation they had. You know, that they would, they, the, um, those three trans women between Carrie. Kwanzaa and the Juicy um, lady, they had a chance to just, you know, sit down and, you know, let their hair down and talk about some things and, you know, just discuss, you know, life as a trans woman, this, that, and the third, and their experiences as trans women of color, black trans women, shit, damn, of color, black trans women. So that was real cute. That was real good. Then we got to the best scene of the episode. As much as I can't stand the Blunder Twins, oh my God, they get on my fucking nerves. They did give us the best scene of the episode, which is when they actually went and um, um, they went to the lost and found um, youth uh, place shelter, um, emergency bed shelter place. And, you know, they, they learned all about the place and what they offer and the fact that they offer 24 hour emergency beds and shelter for youth that have been kicked out. Because, you know, that's the story of a lot of youth. You know, they may um, they may either come out to their parents or their parents may. Um, find out about them or catch them in the act or something or see something and figure out their sexual orientation and then now this child is left out on the streets with nowhere to go and nowhere to stay and it, it, it's so so tragic to hear these stories and to see situations where you have a child that has nowhere to go 
that that has been rejected by the all their own parents, the people who gave them life, have rejected them and told them we want no parts of you. And now you're just you know a wayward soul out on the streets. And so shouts out to organizations like Lost and Found Youth for doing what they can. And and I, and I wish that more money was being put into organizations like that because they said they unfortunately only have 18 beds. And so in a city like Atlanta, which has a huge um, LGBTQIA plus population, I can imagine that that's nowhere near a drop in the bucket in terms of the amount of capacity that they may need. But um, yet and still, they're doing, you know, they're doing good work. They're doing the Lord's work. And um, shouts out to that organization. This was a beautiful scene. As much as, and I've said this over and over and over, as much as I give Gerald about some of his antics, I keep saying Gerald, his, that's his thing. Gerald has a heart. Gerald has, um, J I mean, he has a heart for giving. And this is something you can see he's very passionate about. And like I said, this is his, this is what he's supposed to be doing. And I would love to see Gerald doing more and more of this and less of the fuck shit that he be having going on. More of this, Gerald. And maybe you'll be likable. Jerome. I don't know if it's, there's no salvaging him. I don't know if there's any, you know, way to save him. Anyway, we then see um, Malik invites the cast out to go do some yoga. Sans the Blunder Twins. Um, but you only end up having Malik, Roshane, um, Jamie, and Tristan. I think the four of them ended up being there. And I wrote down in my notes, is there a budding romance between Malik and Roro Roshane? I don't know because Malik mentioned that he might have wanted it to just be for him and Roshane alone. And maybe production talked him into making it, you know, a casting. I don't know, but in quite Roro, Roro, you don't roll some of that big um Malik train over there. Malik got a lot of meat, Roro. Roro, you don't climb that mountain over there? You don't climb the Malik mountain? Huh? Inquiring minds want to know. Roro, I know you watch my reviews from time to time. I got questions. I need answers. I'm just saying, let your girl know how it was, honey, because that's a large mountain to climb, honey. I synced it. I synced it. Anyway, um, so then after the yoga, they went out. And um, is that the reason that Malik stood up, Carrie? Because he knew that Carrie was Roro's roommate and he liked Roro and not Carrie. Child. I'm just saying. They went out on the balcony after the um yoga and they had like, you know, little finger food and stuff like that. And they just was, they were just talking about things and how the season went. And then there was this whole conversation about Gerald and, you know, um, Roche was mimicking Gerald and talking about Gerald and some of his anger issues or whatever. And so forth. And it was just, you know, a little light, light, little light, light or whatever. And, you know, Kiki, Kaka, shout out to my bro, Jaded Nerd. And um, it kind of went off from there. And, and that's how the season ended. Um, kind of anticlimactic, if you're asking me, you know. Um, but we made it through. <laughs> Girl, we made it through. So that was episode nine, the season finale of Real Life and Philanthropy. We have seen the trailer for the reunion, and it seems to be very explosive. I've been told that there's two parts to the reunion. We'll see how this goes. Um, that's all I got. Look out perhaps for more interviews and so forth. And definitely my review of the reunion, um, the first and second parts of the reunion. That's all I got for y'all. Until next time, thank y'all for coming. Y'all drive safely. I'm out.